I thought it's just engineers like me. But Google is freaking out more than anyone about ChatGPT. In fact, this year Google has planned to unveil more than 20 projects powered by AI. Anyways, let's talk about ChatGPT. It can answer questions, write stories, and even make jokes. It's kind of like having a robot helper that can understand you when you talk to it. But so is Siri or Alexa that you might already have on your phone or at home. So why so much buzz around ChatGPT? What can it really do, especially for software engineers? My goal here is to make this the most informative and concise video tutorial where you'll learn how it is to be used to its full potential for your own benefit. So let's begin. ChatGPT is a cutting edge AI tool created by OpenAI. It got released in November 2022 and gained 1 million users in just 5 days. In comparison, it took Facebook 10 months and Netflix 3.5 years to get the same number of users. You can use it to create content for your YouTube videos, write articles, help improve your resume, prepare for a job interview. You can also use it to generate code in Java, Python, JavaScript, SQL, HTML, CSS and whatnot. It can write tests for you, generate mock data and in fact translate code from one language to another. And if you don't understand a piece of code, it will also explain you step by step. Well, sometimes it explains a bit too much. And it can do all this because of its language model. So if you ask ChatGPT, tell me about yourself. I told you, sometimes it explains too much. But anyways, ChatGPT is a language model. Language model is a type of software to understand and generate human language. And it does this by looking at massive amount of data and learning the patterns and rules of the language. Now just check out this diagram. The first dot is the amount of data ChatGPT 3 or 3.5 was trained on. That is what I'm currently using. The second is what ChatGPT 4 is being trained on. So for example, if the language model is trained on a lot of Python code, it will learn about the syntax, semantics, the design patterns and best practices in Python. And most importantly, how it can be applied in different contexts. OpenAI is spending $3 million in cloud computing every single day. Add everything up and they might spend about $3 billion this year. This is where Microsoft and genius of Satya Nadella comes in. Microsoft with OpenAI want to build the foundation of AI, which everyone will build on. So that ChatGPT will just be one of the applications and GPT-3 or 3.5 or 4 will be the trained model and Microsoft using its Azure platform will provide the computing power. Prompts are the foundation of all the AI tools, including ChatGPT. How well you can prompt defines the value you get from the AI platforms. If you don't know, a prompt is the information you feed to an AI to do what you want it to do. For example, here is me prompting ChatGPT to write an SQL query to create an employee table. Now, every new ChatGPT conversation is a new one baby. It has no context for anything you want it to do. So in this case, it wrote a SQL query for us with the most common columns. Now, of course, you can explicitly prompt it with your own choice of columns. By giving it leading prompts, you can push the chat GPT to answer less generically and with more detail. You can go deeper with chat GPT if you learn some basics of prompt engineering. But for now, let's scratch the surface of chat GPT with some useful software engineering prompts and have it write some code for us in SQL, Java, Python, HTML, and CSS. Getting started with ChatGPT is extremely easy. Just go to the browser and type chat.openai.com and sign up. All right, so let's ask ChatGPT to code in Java to connect to MySQL database. And look at that. It's creating all the boilerplate code which I used to write for years. Wow, and it also gives us to write the hostname, port, DB name, username, and whatnot. In fact, it is also asking you to use the MySQL connector J library. How about asking it to convert the code to Python? Hmm, this looks much smaller. And we get the same advices again. Well, let's ask it to write a SQL query to create an employee table. And just like before, it is creating an employee table with all the columns it thinks are needed in an employee table. How about writing the same query in Cassandra? I guess it has to use SQL for that. Yes, it's a NoSQL database, but yeah, there you go. It's writing a SQL query for us. Well, can it do it in Mongo as well? 
And right off the bat, it says Mongo is a document-oriented NoSQL database, and it doesn't use the traditional row-column model. But regardless, I think it's going to create. And yes, there you go. It is creating an example for us on how to insert a document into a collection called employee. That's awesome. Let's try something complex. How about write a code to get Twitter trends and extract first five tweets of each trend, say in Python. It looks like it is importing something called as Twippy with some Twitter API credentials, connecting to the Twitter API. It also saying that you need to replace your consumer key secret and token and that I need to have this Twippy library installed and that I need a developer account. That is to access the API key and then I can use it to access the Twitter data. Hmm, but how do I get a developer account? ChatGPT. And looks like it is giving me step-by-step -step instructions on how to get a Twitter developer account. In fact, it also says that I submit the application and wait for Twitter to review it. And this can take several days. And I don't doubt that. How about asking it to write a Python-based AWS Lambda to validate and split files into half? In fact, if you notice, I have a typo here but it is still writing the code for me. And as a common practice, it expects the file from S3 bucket, does some basic validation of the file for me, splits it, and also explains me some of the assumptions, such as how the Lambda function is triggered and that the Boto3 client is needed. Fantastic. In fact, it is also advising me that I need to configure my Lambda function to have access to S3. All right, let's say I want to prepare for Fang jobs and want to practice string programming questions. So I have asked it to write down the top five questions. How to implement reverse string, palindrome, non-repeated character, anagram. I can say from my personal experience, I got at least three out of these five questions during my interviews in the past. That's amazing. Let's ask it to implement one of them for us. Let's go with anagram checker in this case. All right, so it is writing the basic boilerplate code. It's also implementing all the functions, but doesn't look like to be an optimized version of Anagram Checker. I would expect it to use hash map somewhere. Yes, there you go. It says it can be optimized or improved accordingly. Um, well, before optimizing it, let's go and check the bigger notations of this or the time complexity. Nice. So it is saying the complexity is O n log n and it also explains step by step on how it came to that conclusion. And that is how you explain bigger notations or time complexity in your interviews. That is you calculate time complexity of each step and then combine it together to come to a conclusion. Now that we know the time complexity, let's ask us to write an optimized code to improve the time complexity. And right away in this new optimized code, it is using hash map this time. Hmm. So what is the time complexity of this above code? And again, it goes step by step, explain the time complexity of each step and then combines it together. And clearly the time complexity here is O of N, which is better than the previous time complexity of O N log. All right, let's ask it to write some unit tests for us. And it came up with two unit tests for now. And it also says that there can be some edge cases. Let's ask it to write those edge cases tests for us as well. And look at that. It checks for the empty string, the null string, and the special characters. And edge case testing like this should suffice for any interview. How about code review? So here I copied code from a public site. I hold shift and enter to go to the next line and paste the code. Okay, I don't want a lecture, but just refactor the code for me, please. Let me stop it. Yes, optimize and refactor the above code for me. Okay, so it made it a little more readable, but the time complexity remains the same. It can probably use the string builder to handle the strings. Uh, let's ask it to optimize it further for us. All right, and as I guess, this time it is using a string builder. And Yes, and in fact, it is also giving us a reasoning of why it is using String Builder because it is easier to handle strings and not create too many strings. And just like our previous problems, it is also printing out the space and time complexity for us. For our last exercise, let's try out some HTML and CSS. It's been a long time that I have done any CSS or HTML. So let me ask you to write a resume of a full stack engineer in HTML first. 
All right, looks like it took it literally. Write some HTML code body. Mm, I'm sorry. Oh, there you go. It is still writing anyways. Now let me copy this generated code to my VS code editor and run it locally. And there it is. How about adding some CSS? Let's copy and save it to our file, refresh the browser. And yes, it is looking better. How about adding better CSS? Maybe some CSS animation. I can see it adding some animations such as fade in effect and playing with the opacity. Now let's refresh the browser again and there we go. It is nicely fading in and without writing HTML code by hand for a long time, I could still get the basics right under a minute.